You're listening to Crazy Shit in Real Estate. You'll be amazed at all these wild but true situations that others have found themselves in. Because on this show, you'll hear uncensored, unbelievable stories from the world of real estate. I'm Lee Brown. Let's dive right in. I'm Lee Brown. This is Crazy Shit in Real Estate. And today might be a slightly crazier episode than usual. And it's my fault. I admit it. I took our guest, Jennifer Davis, down about four different rabbit holes, but she went with me. So enjoy this very random conversation. Some really good truth about real estate towards the end. So stick in there and I'll see you on the other side. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. I hope you are. Oh, you know, it's a beautiful day in Tennessee. So we're doing great. It's drizzly here in North Carolina. And so I'd say that's beautiful considering how dry it's been. I know it's been a strange summer. Yes, it was real wet early, and then it got completely dry and a thousand degrees. (laughs) I know. I'm like, it's like somebody asked me the other day if I was wet, and I'm like, "Mm, kind of. I'm in Tennessee. I mean, what do they say? Animals sweat, men perspire, ladies feel the heat. (laughs) (laughs) That one, I'm gonna add that one to my repertoire. Well, there is my gift from my grandmother to you. (laughs) I know. I say I have like a list, you know, like of things that you learn from my grandmothers and my grandfather. They were like great storytellers, so. They always had some little zinger. Well, maybe that's why you went into the auction business, because auctioning is nothing more than storytelling with a rhythm. Actually, my daddy's an auctioneer. Oh, you're a family of auctioneers? Yeah. And I'm a third generation realtor. And I have my little fake uh, gavel here because you're on my show today. So, you know, like maybe we should talk about it before we record it. But that's one of the things that I want to talk about is being female and getting into the auction business. Because here in Tennessee, I've gotten a lot of pushback. Well, I'm already recording because I never know when the conversation is going to be amazing. Good for you. Well, I'm, go- I'm good for it. So, I want to know about that, though, because, you know, I just finished my auction school. I've got my license and test for North Carolina coming up since we're one of the states that does require a state exam. And I did think it was interesting because I'm looking. I don't know the auction world, and you probably do because you're in the family. I, I know a little bit of it. I mean, it's like, like my parents were divorced. Uh-huh. So I was with my mom, which is a realtor, and my grandmother, which was a realtor. Okay, so my- you got the realtor side on the mom side and dad's side is auction side. And realty, farm auctions. Oh, okay. So anyway, but in Tennessee, you have to take a class, mm-hmm. then you have to take a test, and then you have to go through an apprentice program or an affiliate program. Oh, it's class plus apprentice because North Carolina, you can apprentice or take the class. Yes, it's both. And then through the apprentice program, they have like a list of classes, that you, a list of points. So bid calling, I think it's 60 points. Ringman is 40 points. And then like the clerk and the traditionally like female kinds of jobs are worth 10 points. Huh? So, now, I, w- I wouldn't mind being a ringman. That was fun. Well, I just think it's, I mean, I'm going to do it because that's what you have to do to get your class, you know, but I just think it's interesting Look, my kitty's trying to get in here with us. I think it's interesting that the more male kinds of positions are worth significantly more than what the traditional female roles have been. Well, except that there is the visibility, the risk of being the auctioneer. So I can see that the bid caller carries the most liability and the clerk's got to keep everything cleaned up. Ringman, I don't know why that's worth more than clerk, though, points-wise. That's kind of interesting because you're really just there to jazz the crowd up and look for bids. I mean, I'm not real sure. And it's like and I've um, apprenticed with like two different auctioneers and I either fired them or they fired me. How um, was that? Well, the first one, it was just a personality thing. And the second one, it was another female auctioneer. And she didn't have much real estate experience Mm -hmm. and I have quite a bit more real estate experience and even auction experience. And we knew that going in, we talked about it, you know, like that I know what I'm doing basically, and you don't know what you're doing at all, (laughs) but you have to have somebody sign this piece of paper. Right. And it was just a real conflict of like a personality conflict because she wanted to do everything right, but she didn't really know what she was doing. So we had one auction together and it was like a total flop. It should have been like a ringer, you know, like a no brainer, but Mm -hmm. it didn't go so well. And she didn't want me to really participate in the auction process itself. We were going to do it online and in person. So a hybrid auction, it was a piece of a state real estate property. It should have been really easy, but 
it's still for sale if anybody wants to buy 13 acres in Nashville. Okay, so then let's go backwards in Jennifer Davis's life and tell the audience how long you've been doing real estate. Obviously, you grew up around real estate and auctions. So how long has this been your career of choice? Are you coming back into the family business after being somewhere else? And where in Tennessee are you? Give them a little bit of the Jennifer story. Yeah. So my name's Jennifer Davis and I live in Robertson County. My family has been in Robertson County since before Tennessee was a state. So basically in the same place since 1786. I jumped the fence. My granddaddy told me that I didn't take to the bit very well. So you just <laughs> so after I finished undergraduate school, I got married, moved to Alaska, and lived on the West Coast in and out most of my adult life. Came back to Tennessee when my daughter was five. She's 11 now. Just so that she could have a sense of where she's from. Because always being from here has been an important part of who I am and I sort of felt like there's no way she can be a Tennessean if she ain't raised in Tennessee. You got to know what matter sounds like. So I've had a long and sordid career. I sold industrial power equipment when I was in Alaska. And after I went to graduate school, I opened an organic grocery store in Sandy, Oregon. Because I've always been interested in food and culture and how people feed each other. And then when we moved back to Tennessee, I started a business called Rabbit Circle. And I was doing an agricultural history tour of Middle Tennessee. So I basically made a business of like riding around, drinking beer, talking about the neighbors, you know, like being like a rural teenager. That sounds so fun. I would sign up for that in a flat minute. It was an awesome time. The majority of my clients were European travelers because, you know, it's a thing to go to another country, go to a pineapple farm, to go to a coffee Mm -hmm. farm. We come to Nashville. And you have Broadway, and then there was like nothing else. So I catered toward that European adventure traveler. It was going awesome. And then COVID happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there went tourism. And I still have this child to feed. So I just took kind of all my content and all my stuff and started doing real estate. Because like you said, like I told you before, it's a family business. And it's like, It was really easy just to go into it. And if you're doing the farm tours, you're already out and about in the real estate space anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's like I'm in the country. I mean, it's okay. It's like you kind of know everybody. I actually had took my real estate test the first time when I was 18. And I did not place my license because at the time I knew I couldn't compete with my parents. And both my parents had real estate license. And I was like, mm, that whole Southern thing of your parents and, you know, are they anybody going to take you seriously as an 18 year old? Just forget it. It ain't happening. So you let it go. You had the license and let it go and had to start over. I did. I did. Because I never even placed them anywhere. I just took the test. So this is where we should tell all of our listeners, if you're in real estate and you have your license, find a place to park it so you don't let it go just in case the future life changes. And if you're a consumer who wants your license and you get it, don't let it go. Park it somewhere so you don't have to start over again. Exactly. It's just one of those life things. You just want to keep it in your back pocket. But you came back and got in. So I want to know, though, I probably shouldn't go down the rabbit hole because obviously we could go way off the real estate track. I am very worried about what's happening to our food supply right now from a from a standpoint of we're eating so much garbage, it's destroying our bodies. And that's part of the reason why I started an organic grocery store and started kind of the right. But even the organic stuff is so poisoned by the government NGOs. I don't yeah. know that I trust anything organic unless it comes from somebody at church's garden, you know? Well, that I mean, that's the point, the whole church at somebody's garden, because we, especially being from Tennessee and North Carolina, basically you can put a rock in the ground and it'll grow. Except for this year, let's full disclosure, it's a bad garden year, but it's dry. So just half yeah. in garden and world, farming world, you have dry years. So you're eating potatoes. You'll be all right. All right. right. Eat canned stuff. Eat the stuff I canned last year that's left over. Exactly. Let me ask you this, though, because when you're looking at those farm tours, was there any knowledge and education from your clientele about what's happening to U.S. farmland, about how it's getting purchased up by foreign governments, how Bill Gates is buying farmland. Were they aware of that? Because I do find that a lot of international travelers tend to be more astute than maybe our local. I haven't seen them. A couple days, a couple weeks. I don't know. I mean, the house is empty. Yeah, I just bought the house from him. So, But I haven't seen him and I've been cleaning up mowing the yard over there maybe a week or two. See, this is like real estate problems. I'm sitting on my back porch and I can see my neighbor's house. And I just purchased my neighbor's house. Oh, okay. 
and the cops are over there looking for him. Well, there might be a whole story you have to come back and tell them. <laughs> uh, there is definitely. It's like, we don't wait till that one settles down, then I'll tell you. <laughs> I was going to tell the production team to cut that out, but now I'm totally not cutting it out. because It's I'm fine. Leave it there. Let's just, I'm just going to tell you, drugs are bad. Drugs are bad. Which drugs kind of are bad. Are we talking like? The kind that they're trying to make legal or the kind that... The kind that should be illegal forever. The kind you can't buy Sudafed to anymore because of? Yeah, that one. It's like if you go to church, let's see, and you do meth, does that make you a Methodist? But anyway. Well, considering that the Methodists are in the news a lot right now, I mean, it's a whole different ballgame. (laughs) But it's like, we'll do this. But he had a drug problem. He's an engineer, a relatively like successful adult during COVID, got on drugs, life messed up. He's in... California, I think, right now at a sober living house. Good for him. Getting some help. That's awesome. I mean, absolutely. And I bought the house to flip and to clean up. And I think he's in a better place. But obviously, the cops are still looking for him. I mean, there's probably some details they have to button up. But, you know, I wonder, do we look at the data from the COVID era? I haven't seen any discussion or digging in about how many people fell into alcoholism, other drug addiction during that lockdown, during that phase. We There is finally some conversation about what's happening to kids because the kids' suicide rate is still ridiculously high because of the COVID policies. And I wonder when we're going to see some information on that. But then I, then I remember that information is very hard to come by if it's not on the official platform. Like, of what we're like, this all kind of ties back into the whole food thing where you started the question. Honestly, because it's like the sense of community. We grew up, me particularly, grew up in rural Tennessee, and everybody's granny had a garden. And we canned. I used to hate canning green beans. I'm like, why would you want to do this? You can go to Walmart and buy them for 25 cents a can. But we grew up with that culture of food and neighbors. It's like, that's why we eat a meat and three in the South. It's like we have a little bit of meat and three vegetables because it's You're spot on there. And think about it, too. Like underneath that, you could trust Granny's garden. You knew that if she brought you a sack of squash and zucchini at church, that you could go home and fix it. You did not have to scrub it down and worry about pesticides or worry about the GMOs or any of the weird seeds, you knew granny. I I, I mean, I still, in my truck at this very moment, there's a knife and a salt shaker, just in case. In case you run across a watermelon, I know exactly what that salt shaker is for. Or a tomato or a cucumber or like, just in case. Because I would rather drive through somebody's garden than I had drive through, you know, any kind of like fast food place. But when you come with that history of that Southern culture of food and grandparents and like living from the land. It's like they were homesteaders or sustainably farming long before that was ever a trendy word. That was hand to mouth living. It was necessary. What we call sustainable now. You wanted to eat, you had to grow. Exactly. I mean, like everybody had to produce something. And, you know, whether you were the quilter, you know, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, like communities like required cooperation before it was cool to have the word co-op or to think about a a community garden or any of those things it's like that was just a way of life at least for me in the part of the south that i grew up in like we cared for one another and we fed one another if you go to your grandma's house and she didn't like leave with a treat or a sack full of something i mean so you definitely didn't leave hungry like ever and that idea of like feeding one another right because you feed people that you love and that's how I show love. I cook for people. And I, as often as I can, I mail food out if they're out of state because that's the only way I know to, to take action sometimes. My words don't always work and you don't know what not, to write. I know how to feed. My granny would say love is through the mouth. She was right. Yeah. I mean, and it's like we learn as young girls, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. That is the classic advice. And it's true. Mm hmm. Yeah. So like when you come from that culture and then you move to the West Coast and I was in Portland, Oregon or around Portland, Oregon. And, you know, people were talking about, oh, my gosh, can you make bread from scratch? I'm like, yes, I can make biscuits. Do you know how to can green beans? It's like reluctantly. Yes. You know, it was just part of ingrained in who I was. It's like, do you know how to get information about where to grow things? Or like, have you ever been to the actual feed mill? It's like... I was part of a project. It was called Clackamas One Stop, and they spent millions, billions. I mean, it was through the university, Patagonia. They had all these like really big sponsors, and 
they were trying to figure out a way to have a computer network where farmers could communicate their knowledge with one another. Oh, like, super academic, but millions of dollars on it. You know, like it was a thing. And I remember sitting in that one of those meetings one day and I was like, you know what? These dumbasses ain't never been to a feed mill. Never. Because if you've ever been around any old farmer, they know every other old farmer for 700 miles way before there was a cell phone. Mm -hmm. They know who had a welding machine and who had that special wrench and whose crops were bad. There's always been this network and it's not computer computerized. It's about community. And it's you know, so interesting because I think that's also at the core of what's going on in real estate right now, because realtors have known forever that the community matters. We know that if a certain agent calls me, I know that their word is good. I know that they use good people. And if some other agents call me, I have the little radar on the back of my head saying, check behind it, check behind it, check behind it, which is no different than my granddaddy, who was a cotton farmer, knowing whose weights were trusted and whose weights were untrustworthy because they were at the gin mill managing all of these things. And of course, I was too young to know all the things that he knew. But like you said, he knew everybody and he knew all their characteristics. But we know the same thing in real estate. It's fascinating that the business is officially a couple of million licenses in the country, but the ones who do most of the business, it's a small, small group and they know each other very well. And that benefits the consumer because if you talk about that community, the benefit is we can trust what we're given. We can trust the information, but you also know how to lean on each other. So you talk about that farmer community and what happens they know if somebody's having a rough spot, everybody just pitches in. It's organic. And we've seen that in realtor world, especially with things like the Realtor Relief Foundation, which says, you know what? Somebody else is having a rough time. We're going to pitch in and we'll help them through it. And so it always makes me wonder about the bigger attack on realtors in specific, not just on the trade association, but the messaging that's so negative towards us. Is it also destroying that last community bond that we provide? I think it's very similar to what's happened sort of in the agricultural community. All farms have been I mean, hammered. Yeah. I mean, and it's really about like how we show up and how we show up for one another. Because I mean, honestly, I mean, you know, like we could get on chat GPT and write a real estate contract. That is not what we do. Like for the record, everybody who's watching and listening, chat GPT don't have the foggiest idea what's different state by state. Do not ever do that. I'm not saying it's a good idea. I'm just saying you don't do it. it. She's making a point. <laughs> I'm not saying you should do it. I'm just saying you could do it. <laughs> but what you cannot get on automation and do is have a relationship. Amen. And to know, you know, like that we're going to have a home inspection and I need a handrail fix like right now. And it's like to know those things before you even get there, you like show this house like, oh, yeah, it needs a handrail. There is no amount of automation or quick turn that you can do to have those things. Or when you have especially here, we have a lot of folks that are moving here from out of state. They don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. Bless their hearts. <laughs> Bless them. So, you know, I had a client the other day. They paid $26,000 to have their driveway graded. $26,000. How long was this driveway? Maybe half a mile. Okay. They didn't, have, they didn't have a culvert put in. Did it include the bluestone? No, they had their driveway graded. But just the grader. The guy with the grader charged them $26,000. Yeah. And it was still them coming. <laughs> it was still really bad. And I went over there and they were really upset. And they're like, what do we do about this driveway? And I called the previous owner and I said, Who graded your driveway? And he was like, Oh yeah, the neighbor. So I took a sack of the my sack of peaches or whatever over there. I was like, Would you go meet your neighbors over here? I think they need their driveway graded again. Fixed it. Sack of peaches in a conversation. But they lived in the house for a year and a half and they'd never met their neighbors. And I'm like, I don't understand. I told you when you moved here, like, you have to go meet your neighbors. Like, they're going to be valuable if something happens, if you're away, you know, like, you're going to need that community. But I think they were from, like, Chicago, Illinois kind of area. And they had never lived in a situation where their neighbors were as important or as anything else around them. They didn't have that trust level. And they were going to have to learn trust. And trust is hard to learn, easy to break, but hard to get. Absolutely. And you start talking about that. And I'm thinking there's a house we just trashed out. And I was, while I'm in the driveway, messing around with the dumpster and the, the guys that are graciously pulling all this stuff out of the house in 98 degree heat, 
two doors over, the neighbors come out to, to chit chat because they can see something's going on. And I said, oh, tell me what was going on over here. And they start to tell him how the person would come home and she'd open the garage door, pull in, close the garage door, blinds closed. They never saw her until the repo man came to get her car. And the repo man couldn't get to the car because it was in the garage. And he asked the neighbor who was outside smoking. And, the out and by the way, don't ever judge your neighbors that are outside smoking. That is your security system. The exactly. repo man went over to talk to him and asked if he would you know, call him if he saw her come out. And this man looked at me and he said, I've never met her, but I would never rat her out. <laughs> and I said, I love you for that. And so then I gave him something out of the garage as a gift because we're trashing it out. But it all goes back to the center of what you're talking about. And it's trust. It is community. And where we started our conversation with where you're finding a harder pathway into the auction business is the auction side less community focused than the real estate side because it's just not as relationship heavy, maybe? Well, I wonder, because if you think about, I mean, this is like gets into the super gray area that nobody really likes to talk about, like where the tradition of auctions came from to begin with. So where does the tradition of auctions come from to begin with? Did you learn that in your auction class? I mean, they spent so much time on the UCC, we didn't really talk about the history stuff. I mean, I know that there's chattel slavery had auctions, but they had to them prior to that. The very or is that where it picked up steam? Well, it was Romans, like the chattels of war, the spoils of war. So like after the Romans would go in and pillage and plunder, they would auction off their slaves, their people, whatever, like their booty, whatever they got. So, so the winners got to run the auction. Exactly. The winners got to win. So it's like the two oldest professions in the world. Number one is prostitution. Number two is auctions. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. But not necessarily like how we would consider like a state auctions, but it was that idea of the plunders, you know, the booty, whatever it was that was captured, the spoils, whether it be people or things that they took from other people. And when our Southern sort of tradition from auction comes from when they were unloading things off of a ship on the coast and that call, because we're really the only part of the world that has that significant, like that bid call chant. Because if you notice like in art auctions or in other parts of the world, it's, they're not really bid a bid a bid a bid a. It is, may I have $1, please. May I have $2, please. It's very it's not how they teach it at the Western College of Auctioneering, although we're mainly number focused, but we didn't do the may I's and the please. How did you learn to bid call? Well, they taught us all the tongue twisters, and then we did the number progressions. They, they did not give us filler words until deep into the program so that we would not become lazy and get off of the internal rhythm, which allows the room the chance to get its act together to bid. But you still learn to chant. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and it's like, have you ever watched a Sotheby's auction? They don't chant for nothing. No, they're very boring and stuffy. That's and I was like, that's where, maybe it's not so much the please, but they're very, matter of fact, duh, 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 duh. Well, you know, I'll do a lot of charity auctions. And so I'm all about engaging the crowd. And you can't be dry and boring and engage a crowd. Our auction style has to be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, believe it or not, it's like I didn't learn to chant in bid school or in auction school. I was like, I need to find me like a coach. Matter of fact, I'm looking right now. Femme has got a good one to learn to chant. Oh, the Western College of Auctioneering does just an advanced bid calling class. If you have your license, because they include them pre-licensing, but they have just bid calling. They're fantastic. Highly mm -hmm. recommend. That's probably going to be on my list. You're sure. And then you get to go to Montana and write off a week in Montana. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I started to go to auction school in Montana because I was like, I didn't want to go to auction school. Or my daddy went to auction school. Right. I was like, I'm going to go do something else. And I was like, I love Montana. But well, and these guys are great. But like, I didn't know the auction world like I know the real estate world. So I didn't understand that I was in the room with these world champion bid callers. And then they're showing the videos on the screen. And I'm like, oh, my. But I'm sitting next to this very nice 19-year-old young man. And he was just, oh, oh, because he's in the auction world. Like, he's in a sale barn that his daddy and granddaddy work in. And he knew all the names and knew all the players. And I was like, baby, I don't know any of these people. But this is fantastic. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's like to be a good auctioneer, it's like you said, it's entertaining and it's fun. And I think that's kind of where the industry needs to go because we're talking about like the connotation of auctions. Here, for a long time, it was foreclosures and a right. state. But then you look at Australia and it's luxury. 
But you think about your neighbor's house that you're dealing with now, and we're delighted that he's getting the help he needs, and we hope the police get everything that they need so that everybody can move on with life. But there'll be a story around that property. And Mm -hmm. so that can be something that helps the property get its best market value is that story. Because you and I both know there are people that love a house that they can talk about as much as they like the bedrooms, the bathrooms, and the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Same as like cars or horses or whatever it is. It's like those stories, those connections matter. But I think as real estate has progressed, because here we are two women talking about the history of auctions. We're not being auctioned off. Dick, yay. Yeah, I mean, it'd be a pretty low bid. They'd be like, nope, I want to give it back. You can take her back. back. (laughs) I'll pay you. But it's traditionally been a male-dominated industry. And it's traditionally, what you said, talking about like the spoils of war or the things. And when the COVID real estate market, when we were doing highest and best offers for our clients, and then people were stopping. It's like they were essentially auctioning properties without following the proper procedure. And because of the way we were regulated, there wasn't that full open disclosure. So great point. Yeah. Which is kind of what started me to begin with, because we all know there's a bunch of late, some bunch, a few lazy real estate agents that say highest and best, they get $350,000 and they stop. They don't go to the next person because legally they can't go to the next person and go, I have a cash offer of $350,000, a loaf of bread, and they're going to move in two weeks. They just stop. And if we were doing the best that we could for our clients, we would have full disclosure. We would tell everybody that we have a $350,000 offer, a loaf of bread, and move in two weeks, whatever that might be. Because if we're great point, I think that's one of the biggest frustrations I heard from buyers during the COVID era because everything was, of course, in bidding wars. And now, thank God, it smooths out a little bit where you only have occasional bidding wars. But buyers hate the blind process. They hated us having to tell them, I don't know what the other offers are. If you want to win, this, then we can position it in the best way possible. But we have no way of knowing because there are rules and such that govern it but you're right if there had been an auction mindset it might have been different for the sellers but that would require an extra level of education for people who may or may not want the education they already have because auctions a whole different world like i said the universal the uniform commercial code is a whole different ball of wax but when you look back at the covid market i do wonder how much got left behind by agents who did not know what they were doing It's a big world. And I don't think we've seen the front edge of that yet. Well, it's interesting if you want to take this NAR thing, because basically what they accused realtors of doing is colluding. You know, which is pretty hilarious. (laughs) Because that's what they're regulating us to do is colluding. The very thing that we're blamed or whatever charged of doing is the very thing that they're trying to put into regulation. At least that's what it seems like to me. Oh, they would absolutely like to ban you from being able to pay a buyer's agent. So they're going to price fix on sellers and say that you can't, even if the seller wants to. Again, government agencies cause the problems so often, but our association has, I don't think it's done an adequate job defending the practices of agents because most agents that I know, collusion is the furthest thing from what they do. No, I mean, mean, they can barely return phone calls to each other. How in the hell are they colluding? They're not. Exactly. I mean, it didn't make a lot of sense. But like, if you think about other industries, we order everything else that we do online. We can order a car, you can order your groceries. I mean, you can order based on your yard, anything you can do. And I wonder, and I probably get voted off the island for this, if this is not like some kind of bigger attempt to automate the process. Oh, I think it definitely is. And we can look at that from who the players are when you realize that BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, your three ESG firms, have a stake in all of the players. When you realize that Zillow has a chief advocacy officer in Washington, D.C., working on policy, when you realize that CoStar is trying to take over the world and they're backed by Saudi money, there's all of these big money players that are very dialed into the machine in D.C., Mm -hmm. and so then you realize, okay, if that's all going on, what does that have to do with us? Well, if you can remove the realtor from the process, you remove the trust from the process, you remove the community from the process, and maybe then you can commoditize real estate. Because real estate right now, as we've kind of been talking about, it's not a commodity. It's like you talking about 
how your clients got their driveway fixed by you introducing them to the neighbor, the realtor fixes that. Without a realtor, how do they fix it? They either live with it and hate it and then sell it in the future, or they pay an astronomical amount of money to somebody else. And so you're introducing more expense into the process. Realtors have smoothed it out for all these years because with a house, in fact, the conversation about buying real estate online just makes me absolutely batshit crazy because it doesn't take into account school zone changes and what's happening with the DOT and what's happening with jobs and all the things that realtors know about the surrounding market pieces. Mm -hmm. And then the things that we go in the house and tell somebody, well, the tri-level floor plan was very popular in the 70s. It is now considered obsolete. The realtor is the only one that can tell the buyer that, yeah, you might like it today, but it's an obsolete floor plan, split foyers, split levels, contemporary houses, then the floor plan piece. We talk to people about open houses. Where are you going to put your couch? We have a completely open floor plan. Where's your couch going to go? You're going to float the section on what we're going to do. We help people think and process, and that's unnecessary on a very nice bedroom set you buy online where you just see the measurements. It's unnecessary on the car. It's just crazy. But if you look at like farming, which is where we started this conversation about local agriculture and everybody having a garden and everybody belonging to a community. And now we belong to this industrial agricultural system where the majority of our food is purchased from multinational corporations. BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. They own those big ag firms. It all goes back to that giant money machine at the back end. Yeah. And people are busy doing life. So they're not really paying attention to those little details. But, you know, like what happens to us and when they have control of the food and they have control of our land, we are in trouble. Well, we know what happens when they control everything is we see the obesity rates going up. We see heart disease going up. We see autoimmune diseases going up. And then what's the solution to all that? Oh, big pharma. Oh, that's right. We'll just give you a drug for that. No problem. We'll give you some drugs and no problem. And who owns Big Pharma and Black Rock State Street Vanguard? I mean, it's a little crazy making. And maybe that's why there's this giant attack on realtors. We're not because we're all these little tiny businesses who are, hey, I'm going to learn auction. Hey, I'm going to do real estate. Hey, I want to make things better in my community. We are so not controlled by big money or by the blob. Mm-hmm. I love that. About we're us. I love that we're so different. Yeah, we're most of us are controlled by what's inside. You know, we have a thousand percent. Yeah, we have a genuine concern for where we live and for the people that we live around and are interested in making sure that people have not just houses, but homes. Oh, that was said so nicely, honey. So nice. Yeah, but I mean, it's a thing. It's like, I it's know. Like just I tell people a lot of times they're relocating for it. I'm like, they'll call and they're like, I want a three bedroom, two bath house. I'm like, so I don't care. Tell me what makes you happy about your house. Tell me what you dream about. You know, like, tell me what you want to do when you get there. Like, 90% of the houses have three bedrooms and two baths. Congratulations. But all of the other things is what's going to make your house feel like a home. And as opposed to starting a property search with three bedrooms, two baths, with a green front door. Like, let's start with, how do you feel when you get home? Do you want a long drive? Do you want a short drive? Do you want to mow the grass? Do you want to sit under the trees? Do you want to walk to the light? Like all the things. And I think for me anyway, a lot of my clients don't know what they want. They know what the feeling is, but they don't have enough experience finding home to know what the process is. And it has nothing to do with how many bedrooms are in a house. No, because that's where they start. And I think every consumer today, it's got to be close to 100%. They're on the apps. They plug in their price point. They plug in three, two, and then they get inundated with, I don't know. And then they reach out to one of us and they say, what about this house? And you're dead on when you start finding out, hey, you're going to live in that three, two. It's a whole different conversation, especially when we have these, I like to call them economic refugees that are coming in from high tax states to North Carolina, Tennessee, looking for four seasons and a better tax environment. But they don't know how to differentiate until we walk them through the process. And it goes back to I think why real estate can't be bought online, because if you just put a 3-2 into Amazon, you have no way to sort it out. And you could put it on Google Maps. Okay, great. Still, now what you going to do? So I love I love what you're talking about. And again, it just goes back to the core of trust and community, 
Okay, so Jennifer, we have rambled all over the place, which is frankly my favorite kind of conversation in this podcast. So thank you for rambling with me. If there was one thing you could leave behind as a piece of advice for the people that are moving to Tennessee from somewhere else, what's the one thing you wish they would consider when they get there? To slow down. That applies to everybody. Really, just calm down and slow down. We're going to get through this. I tell it's the little pep talk I tell everybody. It's like somewhere in this process, you are going to want to scream at somebody. Please call me. My family trauma is my superpower. Just go ahead, call and scream at me. I won't take it personal. We've all been into the hayfield or the tobacco patch or something. It's like, I'm not worried about it if you're mad or hot or whatever. It's like, it'll be fine. We'll get through this. Just slow down. Because so often they're just in that snap, 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 and they're missing the opportunity. Especially for me, the kinds of clients that I like to work with, we're looking for a home. We're not looking for a house. If you want to look for a house, I can refer you to somebody. It ain't me. Honey, I had to put my glasses on right now when you said your family trauma is your superpower. (laughs) I'm thinking that's seriously my favorite thing that you've said today. You've said a lot of really good, insightful things. Oh my gosh, that encapsulates in one phrase, the connectivity of relationship and what makes you successful, whether you're in Tennessee or Alaska or doing auction or real estate. And I just love you for it. I love you for it. You know, this will be the clip. Girl, we're going to run that on TikTok and stories and people are going to say, yes, Jennifer, yes. (laughs) But I mean, it's like, and that's, I love TikTok. I'm goofy on TikTok. It's like, I have a graduate degree. You know, like I'm an educated redneck. Like I can do whatever you want me to do. But I feel like the most important thing that I can do or the most important skill I have to offer is just to be a real person. Amen. Just just be what you are. I think you should say it's a graduate degree in family trauma now. This may have to go on your business card and people be like, what's going on here? You're like, nothing you can tell me is going to shake me. (laughs) If you've ever been in a tobacco patch and it's 100 degrees and your fingers are black and something breaks. You've never had a dog cussing like that. And you're like, well, wait a minute. What the hell did I do? Like, I didn't do anything. Yeah, but you keep going because when you're getting hollered at, the best thing you can do is keep your nose down and keep going. Exactly. Just keep doing because it ain't going to get any better. Just like, okay, they're having a moment. Keep going. Oh, Jennifer Davis, what's the best way for people to find you? Is it your website? Is it text or email? Because obviously, friends, I will put all of her handles and all her stuff in the show notes. But what's the best way to find you? So it's really easy. My name is Jennifer Davis and I am from Tennessee. That is my website. That is my TikTok handle. That is all of my things. Jennifer Davis, I am from Tennessee. But now y'all will never forget. And I know y'all are going to want to be besties with her too. And if you feel like you found your home listening to this podcast or you don't know where in the hell you have landed, don't worry. I am North Carolina. She is Tennessee. And this has been crazy shit in real estate. So hit the bell to subscribe. Leave us a comment. Say something about... Your favorite Jennifer quote, frankly, because I've got a half a dozen myself down here in the comments. And most importantly, we'll see you next time. As always, I'm so super thrilled that you joined in for more crazy shit. And if you're a realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular human being who happens to have an unbelievable story that you need to tell the world about, or frankly, you just need to one-up the story you just heard, then make sure to DM me on Instagram at Lee Thomas Brown or tweet me at Lee Brown or frankly, any social network where you hang out. I'm there. And if you had some fun, then you totally won't just subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. 